Welcome to this video, where we're going to be discussing the mechanism of action of furuzamide. Furuzamide belongs to a group of medications known as loop diuretics. Diuretic means to cause an increased amount of urine, and loop refers to the loop of Henle, which is the target site of furuzamide. Therefore, Furuzamide is used to remove excess water from the body by increasing urine output by the kidneys. So let's now look at the mechanism of action of furuzamide. The kidneys are responsible for several homeostatic processes, which include the regulation of electrolytes and the regulation of blood volume by conserving or eliminating water. The nephron is the functional aspect of the kidney that is responsible for filtration, reabsorption, secretion and excretion of urine. There are approximately 1 to 1.5 million nephrons in each kidney. The nephron consists of several key structures which include the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, which has the descending and ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. The glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, and distal convoluted tubule are situated in the cortex of the kidney whereas the loop of Henle and collecting duct are situated in the medulla of the kidney. The Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule is the filtering unit of the nephron. This is where fluid and small molecules are filtered from the glomerular capillaries and into the capsular space, where it is now known as filtrate. Filtrate then enters the proximal convoluted tubule which is the main site for tubular reabsorption of electrolytes and water, and where 100% of amino acids and glucose are reabsorbed in normal health. The descending limb of the loop of Henle is responsible for further reabsorption of water, but does not allow for the movement of electrolytes, so water will exit the tubule and into the interstitial space of the renal medulla, but electrolytes will not. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle is responsible for further reabsorption of electrolytes such as sodium, potassium and chloride, but it is impermeable to water. The filtrate will now enter the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Reabsorption of solutes and water in these areas are heavily influenced by hormones such as parathyroid hormone, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. The solution that is left we refer to as urine. As we descend from the cortex of the kidney and into the medulla, the interstitial osmolality increases. Osmolality is a measure of how much one substance is dissolved in a solution. The greater the concentration of the substance dissolved, the higher the osmolality. Very salty water has a high osmolality. So we can think of the kidney as becoming more salty as we descend from the cortex to the medulla. We mentioned that the descending limb of the loop of Henle is responsible for the reabsorption of water from the kidney tubule and into the interstitial space of the kidney medulla, where it can then be reabsorbed into the intravascular space. The movement of water from the kidney tubule and into the interstitial space of the kidney medulla is dependent on the medulla having a high osmolality or having a high salt concentration which draws fluid from out of the tubule. This movement of water from the tubule and into the interstitial space is achieved by osmosis and osmosis is the diffusion of water molecules from a region of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Water is in a higher concentration within the descending limb of the loop of Henle 
than it is in the kidney medulla because there are so many solutes in there. So it naturally wants to move down its concentration gradient from within the tubule where it is in high concentration and into the kidney medulla where it is in low concentration in comparison to the amount of salt. The filtrate entering the ascending limb of the loop of Henle now has less water, making the filtrate more concentrated because there are the same amount of solutes but less water. Therefore, the osmolality of the filtrate has increased within the renal tubule because there are more solutes in less solution. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle is responsible for further reabsorption of solutes such as sodium, potassium and chloride, but it is impermeable to water. It is the reabsorption of solutes in this area that controls the osmolality or saltiness of the kidney medulla. To understand how thiruzamide works, we're going to zoom in on a cell within the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. As we mentioned, the ascending limb is responsible for the reabsorption of solutes from the tubule and into the interstitial space of the kidney medulla. A transporter that plays a key role in this reabsorption of solutes is the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter. As the name implies, this cotransporter is responsible for the reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride from the tubule. Once within the cell, sodium will be pumped out into the medulla through the sodium potassium pumps, contributing to the osmolality or saltiness of the medulla, which will in turn draw water from out the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Chloride will also move into the interstitial space through chloride transporters. Some of the potassium, which is moved into the cell via the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter and the sodium potassium pump, will leak back out into the tubule. And because potassium is positively charged, it will increase the overall charge within the tubule. This causes other positively charged ions, such as calcium and magnesium, to leave the tubular lumen and move into the interstitial space of the kidney medulla. The sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter is the target site of ferrosamide. Ferrosamide inhibits these pumps from working, and therefore, sodium, potassium, and chloride fails to be reabsorbed into the tubular cell and remains within the tubule. This will therefore reduce the amount of sodium and chloride entering the interstitial space, reducing the osmolality or saltiness of the renal medulla. This means less water is reabsorbed from the descending limb of the loop of Henle. This effect is further enhanced because it increases the osmolality or saltiness of the filtrate, so more water is kept within the renal tubule and lost in the urine. This decreased reabsorption of water and increased elimination reduces total water volume within the body. The reason ferrosamide is such a potent diuretic is because as much as 25% of sodium within the nephron is reabsorbed in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Ferrosamide will not only increase the elimination of water, but will also increase the elimination of sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium and magnesium. Ferrosamide also exerts a direct vasodilatory effect, which increases its therapeutic effectiveness. However, the exact mechanism by which it does this is not clear. The vasodilation caused by ferrosamide is thought to be achieved by reducing the responsiveness to vasoconstrictors, such as angiotensin II and adrenaline. 
as well as a decreased production of endogenous natriuretic hormones with vasoconstricting properties. It may also lead to an increased production of prostaglandins, which have vasodilating properties. So, now that we have an understanding of how ferruzamide works, let's move on to look at the pharmacokinetics. Ferruzamide is either absorbed by the GI tract if given orally, or is absorbed directly into the venous system if given intravenously. Oral administration will decrease the amount of drug that reaches systemic circulation, and therefore the kidney. This is referred to as the bioavailability of the drug, as opposed to intravenous ferruzamide, where 100% of the drug reaches systemic circulation by bypassing the liver. In healthy individuals, greater than 95% of ferruzamide is bound to plasma proteins, such as albumin. Only 2-4% to of ferruzamide is existent in an unbound form. The metabolism of ferruzamide occurs mainly in the kidneys and the liver. The kidneys are responsible for about 85% of total ferruzamide clearance, and elimination is via the urine. Following oral administration, the onset of action is approximately 1 to 1.5 one hours, and the peak effect is reached within the first 2 hours. The duration of effect following oral administration is about 4 to 6 hours, but may last up to 8 hours which is why oral ferruzamide is usually taken in the morning to prevent increased urination throughout the night. Following intravenous administration, the onset of effect is within 5 minutes. The duration of action following intravenous administration is approximately 2 hours, and the terminal half-life of ferruzamide is approximately 2 hours. However, this may prolong in patients with chronic renal disease. Let's now look at the indications for ferruzamide. However, it is essential that you always act within your scope of practice and check local guidelines. We know that ferruzamide causes a reduction in total water volume by removing sodium and water via the kidneys. So, ferruzamide is utilised in edematous conditions to remove fluid and relieve the symptoms of excessive fluid volume. These include pulmonary edema, which is a very broad and descriptive term, and is usually defined as an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the extravascular compartments of the lung, such as the interstitial space and the alveoli. This impairs gaseous exchange making it difficult to breathe. Another indication is peripheral edema, which is where there is a shift of fluid from the intravascular compartment and in to the interstitial space, which predominantly affects the lower extremities. And ascites, which is the accumulation of fluid within the abdominal cavity. Ferruzamide can also be utilised in resistant hypertension to help reduce blood volume and total peripheral resistance because we know that ferruzamide has vasodilatory effects. Although ferruzamide may be used to treat edematous states that are as a result of liver cirrhosis and renal failure, it is contraindicated in patients who have anuria or reduced GCS associated with liver cirrhosis or renal failure. Other contraindications include patients with hypokalemia or severe hyponatremia because we know that ferruzamide will cause an increased excretion of potassium and sodium and ferruzamide should not be used to treat pregnancy-induced hypertension. Ferruzamide should be used cautiously in those with gout or diabetes. This is because ferruzamide can reduce the clearance of uric acid. 
which can then lead to uric acid crystals being deposited in the joints and worsening gout. Feruzamide can also cause hyperglycemia, although this is very rare. This is because potassium is used to release insulin from the pancreatic beta cells. So, if feruzamide causes a reduction in total body potassium, it can lead to a reduction in insulin release. This will prevent the absorption of glucose from the blood and into the cells, causing hyperglycemia. So let's now look at some of the adverse effects that patients may experience when taking feruzamide. Common side effects include orthostatic hypotension, also known as postural hypotension, which refers to a drop in blood pressure when standing from a sitting or laid down position, which can cause the patient to become dizzy or even faint. This is caused by a reduction in circulating fluid volume and vasodilatory effects of feruzamide. Patients may also experience dizziness, which may be due to orthostatic hypotension or due to the ototoxic effect of feruzamide. A similar sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporter is responsible for regulating endolymph within the ear. Therefore, the patient may experience vestibular symptoms. Patients may experience electrolyte imbalances due to the loss of electrolytes in the urine. These include hyponatremia, which is low sodium levels, hypokalemia, which is low potassium levels, and hypochloremia, which is low chloride levels. As chloride levels decrease, patients may experience a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, which is a metabolic condition in which the pH rises beyond the normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. Patients may also experience hypovolemia, also known as volume depletion, and this is a state of abnormally low fluid within the body, beyond what was intended when administering the drug. And finally, patients may experience muscle spasms, headaches, nausea and fatigue. To recap, feruzamide belongs to a group of medications known as loop diuretics, and causes the excretion of fluid and electrolytes by the kidney. This is achieved by inhibiting the sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporters located on cells within the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Feruzamide also has vasodilatory effects, which contribute to its therapeutic effectiveness. Feruzamide is used in edematous states such as acute pulmonary edema, peripheral edema and ascites, as well as resistant hypertension. Adverse effects are mainly attributed to the loss of fluid and electrolytes. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.